Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And I'd like to start with our uh, speech and expression uh, norms here at Georgetown. Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as the speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event respect the rights of the speakers and the organizing groups to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. At the conclusion of this event, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, we'll have mics in the aisles and um, we invite folks to come up. Um, you may ask questions and engage in dialogue and, and we will ask and I'll remind everyone to try to have those be questions and not comments. Um, just in the interest of time, we have a large group and hopefully we'll have an, an interesting uh, conversation. So. My name is Fida Adeli, and I'd like to welcome you to the Karima Khouri Annual Distinguished Lecture in Arab Studies. I'm the director, my, I am the director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, as well as an associate professor and the Clovis and Hala Salam Maksud Chair in Arab Studies at Georgetown University. And before I introduce our honored speaker for this evening, I'd like to say a few words about Karima Khouri, in whose memory this lecture is being held. Karima Khouri was born on July 30th, 1904 in Beirut, where she was raised and educated. She was one of eight children, six of whom immigrated to the US. One of her brothers served in the Air Corps and died in action during World War II. Karima was extremely generous to her family, taking on such responsibilities as sponsoring a nephew to come to the US and subsequently supporting him throughout, throughout his education. From 1948 to 67, she worked as a translator at the Library of Congress, and she was also very active in the Lutheran Church throughout her life. Karim Khouri passed away on March 13, 1986. Her family, who hail from the Khouri, Armali, and Maqdisi families, generously endowed this lectureship in her name in order to bring an eminent scholar of the Arab world to Georgetown University to give a public lecture. The first lecture was given by Edward Said, and others have included Roger Owen, Albert Harani, Leila Abulughad, Hisham Sharabi, and Kamal Bulata. How wonderful that Karima's family saw fit to endow a lecture series that would enable generations to come together and learn from some of the most important intellectuals of our time. We at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and in the Georgetown community continue to be the privileged beneficiaries of their generosity and their vision, and Karima Khouri's memory will be kept alive through this gift. Our past speakers have been diverse. We've had scholars of Islam, cities, gender, Arab intellectual thought. We've had artists. Many of our past speakers were invited to reflect on pivotal moments in the Arab world and have been important public intellectuals. And we find ourselves in such a moment today, a violent and tragic moment with a war in Gaza, which has killed nearly, in, in which Israeli forces have killed nearly 30,000 Palestinians in the past four months. And we sit in Washington DC, where the United States government is currently considering sending billions of dollars uh, to fund this war. So this is indeed a pivotal moment um, for those of us who read, study, engage with, come from the Arab world. And so with this sobering reality in mind, we chose this year's lecturer for her insightful scholarship on international law and her critical role as a scholar and public intellectual. Professor Noura Arakat is a human rights attorney and an associate professor in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program of Criminal in Criminal Justice at Rutgers University. Her research interests include human rights law, humanitarian law, national security law, refugee law, social justice, and critical race theory. She recently completed a non-resident fellowship in religious literacy in the Religious Literacy Project at the Harvard Divinity School. She is the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, published by Stanford University in 2019, which received the Palestine Book Award and the Bronze Medal for the Independent Publishers Book Award in Current Events and Foreign Affairs. She's the co-founding editor of Jadalia, 
and an editorial board member of the Journal of Palestine Studies, as well as Human Geography. She is the co-founding, a co-founding board member of the DC Palestinian Film and Arts Festival. She has served as legal counsel for a congressional subcommittee in the House of Repres US House of Representatives, as a legal advocate for the Bedil Resource Center for Palestinian Refugee and Residency Rights, and a national organizer for the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Nora has also produced video documentaries, including Gaza in Context and Black Palestinian Solidarity. Her writings have appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Nation, Al Jazeera, and the Boston Review. She is a frequent commentator on CBS News, CNN, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, the BBC, and NPR, amongst others. In 2022, she was selected as a Freedom Fellow by the Margaret Casey Foundation. It is our great honor to have Nora with us today. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Nora Arakat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very few things have been offering, I'm sure many of us, joy in these moments. But in uh, full confession, I am feeling joy in your audience and in your company, and especially to be back um, at Georgetown with the community of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, who gave me my first opportunity to wade into academia um, in 2008. I think thanks to Professor Rochelle Davis and obviously Professor Bassam Haddad, I was exploring how is it when our first cases against two Israeli officials were dismissed on non-justiciability grounds, the political question doctrine, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which comes up just a few weeks ago, when the Center for Constitutional Rights brings their case in the Northern District of California, and I'm happy to talk about that. But when I was studying oh, all we need to do is figure out a more favorable jurisdiction in order to bring these cases. What ends up happening is I begin to recognize, wait a minute, this isn't about a more favorable jurisdiction. There's actually bias here. If I control for the identity of the plaintiffs and the, and the defendants, then I can show that there's bias against Palestinian uh, claimants and bias in favor of an Arab ones and bias in favor of his um, Israeli defendants. And so CCAS welcomed me to turn that strategic litigation research into my first law review article. So thank you for having me again. Today is day 132 of genocide. On day 126, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced Israel's intention to invade Rafah, the last standing city in Gaza, where Israel ordered Palestinians to seek shelter, now housing one and a half million of Gaza's 2.2 million Palestinians, housing them in makeshift tents without access to water, without access to adequate medical care, without access to food. Palestinians have been eating grass and animal feed. Children have been sleeping in chicken coops in farms. On day 128, as Americans were distracted by the Super Bowl and celebrity relationships, the only nuclear power in the Middle East bombed the Palestinians, concentrated in Rafah, and we did what millions of people around the world have done for the past almost five months now, which is to bear witness. The least that we can do, we did to bear witness. We saw the mutilated body of a seven-year-old Sidra Hasuna hanging from a wire by her shirt due to the impact of the bomb that struck her home and annihilated the rest of her family. We saw an image of a mother and her infant child lying face down on the street who had been sniped by Israeli officers. 
We saw the 136th journalist targeted who survived, but whose legs were blown off. We witnessed a young man dressed in PPP outfit and handcuffs, a prisoner who was forced to enter the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus to tell the sheltering Palestinians that they needed to evacuate. And then we saw his dead body being buried after he was assassinated with three shots to his chest. And when we name what we are seeing in this moment, when each of us who has borne witness dares to name plainly what we are seeing as genocide and responds to our own conscience to demand a ceasefire, we are told that we are racist, that we lack empathy, that we are dangerous. So I wanna take this opportunity to reclaim that power and tell you all that I see what you see, that I feel what you feel, that we are all bearing collective witness and we are being gaslit by superpowers who would like to railroad history with yet another genocide of indigenous peoples in order to forge what they describe as civilization. Even as a possible invasion of Rafah looms large, there is already so much talk, there's so much dissonance, an invasion that promises ethnic cleansing looms large as there are at simultaneously talks, what happens on the day after? Tell us about the two uh, apartheid state solution. And that talk obfuscates the work ahead of us. We must demand accountability for every life shattered, for every future stolen. Not to exact revenge, we do not want revenge. Revenge will only make our wounds deeper and will show that we are no better than our oppressors. Our demand for accountability is to ensure that when we say never again, we mean it. We mean never again for anyone. When we say that there is a possibility of a future, we say not in the image of this sovereignty or in any sovereignty that claims it has the right to genocide. It is for this reason I will address the potential and limits of international law this evening as a site of such accountability. I will begin by reviewing, reviewing the ICJ's decision and then examine Israel's defense or what was not really a defense if you watched um, their hearing on, yeah, yeah, that wasn't great, um, in, in, against the charge of genocide. In doing so, I'll highlight the historical and legal context that makes genocide clear to us in this moment and also demonstrate how that, clar that clarity is likely going to be obfuscated by the International Court of Justice. So I come bearing some bad news. I do not think that the court, when it returns to this case in some six to 13 years, as was the case in Bosnia, for example, will likely decide that this is genocide on the merits. That's the bad news. OK, the not good news. Actually, there's no good news here. Um, but the not good news is we never really depended on the courts anyway to tell us what genocide was. OK. But I want to discuss why is it likely that they won't find with us and what would they take into consideration? How will I show you? If we take legal and historical and political context into consideration, it's undeniable, right? And so then what? So then what? So yeah, this isn't going to be very short either. Thank you for bearing with me. Let's start. I have to control two things here.
I want to see it as well. Okay. On January 26, 2024, the International Court of Justice issued its ruling on South Africa's historic petition charging Israel with genocide and or the failure to prevent genocide in a request for provisional measures. Issued only two weeks after the submission of the application by the Republic of South Africa, the, um, I'm sorry, by the or, in, after the oral arguments, the decision is actually precedent setting in several regards. So I know people were really, really, really disappointed that they didn't demand a ceasefire. But I want to say that that emphasis was misplaced because we should have been focusing on what the court actually did. And they did quite a bit. Okay. Um, and then I'll talk about why they might not have uh, articulated or demanded a ceasefire. So first, what did the court do? First of all, it recognized that South Africa had prima facie jurisdiction standing to bring the case. That was Israel's first argument that they had no standing because there was no dispute according to Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, that that was the wrong treaty, that was the wrong law upon which to adjudicate what was happening in Gaza right now, that this was a war that should be evaluated by the laws of war and not the Genocide Convention. Two very different things because wars are legitimate, even though they can be ugly. But genocide is never okay. And the difference between them is the purpose. What is the purpose of the carnage? That was one. The second thing that the court affirmed which was very powerful, is that the statements made by the Israeli military and its political leaders indicate a specific, well, let me go back just so, if you, I feel like everybody now studied this, right? Everybody knows this now, right? Genocide is the specific intent to destroy a people in whole or in part based on their racial, ethnical, religious, national identity. It's coupled with the specific acts in order to do so. Right? So we went through the first one. The court found that the statements that were made, and these were the exact statements that they pulled up, the statements by Israel Katz, who was a, um, a minister of parliament at the time, by Isaac Herzog, the president of Israel, who was served with a criminal complaint upon, him dis upon his disembarkment in Switzerland to attend the World Economic Forum. He won't be charged, head of state of immunity for now. And Yoav Gallant, the Minister of Defense. Israel argued that none of these statements were about Palestinians. They were actually about Hamas. They weren't really talking about Palestinians. They were talking about Hamas. And even if they did say something about Palestinians, they have no bearing about on the operations on the ground. Well, that's not what your soldiers are telling us in their disgusting TikToks, right? Anyway, all of them, receipts, receipts, receipts. The second thing that we are told, the court also found, is that it recognized that the acts enumerated in the Genocide Convention, four of the five enumerated acts were actually being committed on the ground. And they sourced UN officials, including United Nations Relief Works Agency, which was punished on the same day that this um, came out. And I'm happy to discuss that as well. But the court also agreed that the continuation of Israel's campaign posed the risk of irreparable injury to the Palestinian people. In so doing, it rejected every single one of Israel's arguments. Most significantly, it rejected the argument that this was a war of self-defense, at least at this stage, at least at this stage, that even if they did have the right, and I'll argue that they don't, that whatever they were doing wasn't tantamount to self-defense because its purpose is destruction, not defensive, all right? So, but the, what, what Israel is arguing and what we're going to hear from them, and they admit this, their Israeli lawyers admit this, even in Judge Subutunde's um, separate opinion, so each five of the judges actually issued separate opinions from the um, ICJ's decision. Judge Sabatunde was the Ugandan judge who was more strident even than the Israeli judge to vote against every single one of the provisional measures. She's number the one in the 16 to one decisions, right? Even in her dissent, she agrees that Israel is committing war crimes and crimes against humanity, but distinguishing it from genocide why does that matter? Why does that matter? 
When genocide is first articulated in 1946 during the Nuremberg trials, which precedes the legislation of the Genocide Convention, it is articulated as a crime against humanity, actually. And it's distinct from it, what's so distinct from crimes against humanity is that it can be committed during peacetime or wartime, unlike crimes against humanity, which can only be committed during wartime, which was very significant to the jurists, including the Americans at the time, who did not want anybody interfering in its domestic racist projects during peacetime, okay? Crimes Against Humanity features the systematic targeting of civilians. But genocide features that targeting not just of civilians, but specific groups with the intent to destroy them. The exception, what is not protected in the Genocide Convention amongst these groups? Political groups. So you can annihilate your political opponent because it's not a protected group but you cannot annihilate a group based on its ethnic, religious, national identity. So obviously Israel wants to insist that it's annihilating Hamas because they would not be protected at all as a political group. Forget the other arguments. They just wouldn't be protected even if we didn't hear any of their other arguments. The ICJ, however, declared that Israel was most likely, and here this is important because this is a plausibility standard, which is a very low standard. It just has to be likely. They don't have to prove it as they will at the merit stage, okay? It just has to be most likely that Israel is waging a genocidal campaign and it didn't even engage the self-defense argument at all and found the measures taken by Israel to date because Israel argued, no, we warned the Palestinians to leave to nowhere but we warn the Palestinians to leave. We're talking about the day after. We want a Palestinian leadership. Clearly, we're not trying to annihilate them. The court rejected all of those arguments as not substantive or dispositive of plausible genocide. The provisional measures order that Israel, quote, ensure with immediate effect that its military does not commit the mass killings of civilians does not engage in activities intended to prevent births in the group, does not cause serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group or create the conditions intended to bring about the destruction of the group, as well as to punish incitement to genocide. As put by the South African legal team, the ICJ ordered a ceasefire in everything but name. Is, and I agree, and I agree. Israel must reinstate the unimpeded flow of medicine, shelter, food, not bomb safe zones, hospitals, residential areas, not conduct field executions and mass displacement. Either Israel must conduct its war altogether differently or it cannot conduct its war at all. Nearly one month on, it's clear that Israel has not complied with the provisional measure. So why not then at the time of the decision did the ICJ not demand a ceasefire? Neither the ICJ itself nor the five concurring opinions or dissenting opinions, none of them tell us why. So at most me or any other jurist or any other scholar, at most we can tell you what we think. But this is all conjecture. So I'm gonna give you a few thoughts of, of possibilities, okay? Of why they didn't call for a ceasefire. Number one, let me just say that courts rule in accordance to jurisprudence. They do not want to rule on law that's not in front of them, right? So that's why they're not getting into the self-defense argument. They don't have to answer that question. They just have to answer the genocide question. They also are going to rule based on their, their precedent. And the precedents in this case include the case of the Gambia, which brings a case in dispute of the Genocide Convention against Myanmar for the genocide of the Rohingya, as well as the Ukraine versus Russia. A lot of people felt that this was different from, or that this was double standards because in the Ukraine versus Russia, they did ask for a ceasefire. But that was a completely different fact pattern. In the Ukraine versus Russia, the Ukraine isn't charging Russia with genocide. 
To the contrary, the Q Ukraine is challenging Russia's reason to wage war on the Ukraine because the Ukraine, Russia charged Ukraine with genocide and said that they were invading to protect Russian nationals in two regions in the Ukraine. So that ICJ decision basically rebuffed, rebuffed the Russian argument that Ukraine was committing genocide and why they called for a ceasefire. The more aligned jurisprudence is the Gambia versus Myanmar, almost sim very, very, very similar fact pattern. It begins with the attack of Rohingya troops on 30 police stations in October 2016 that leads to the mass displacement almost a year later and so on and so forth. But in that case, the court also doesn't call for a ceasefire. So my first conjecture is it's just in compliance with its precedent, okay? Number two, the court did not want to address the question of self-defense. Like I said, it doesn't want to address legal questions. It doesn't have to. This is the same of any court, right? They're going to answer the most narrow legal question. And they might be punting that down the road. There is now an ICJ hearing on February 19th that will ask the question if Israel's presence in the West Bank and Gaza is basically illegal because it's prolonged military occupation, there they're going to have to answer these questions. So that's my second conjecture. They're kicking the can down the road, right? The third conjecture that I've heard a lot of people say as well that went kind of viral on social media is you can't call for a ceasefire by only one party. Hamas is not a state. Therefore, you can't impose a ceasefire just on Israel, right? And so they stayed away from it. I'm not sure. Because the same ICJ decision actually called on Israel to, uh, sorry, on Hamas to release the hostages. And even though they don't recognize Hamas as a state actor, they recognize that they can speak to them in the language of humanitarian law. Because Hamas is accountable under humanitarian law as a non-state actor or a nascent sovereign. And so they could have done a workaround like that the same way they did the workaround for hostages. So that one is the least compelling to me. Or... One of the most pragmatic answers is they just wanted to achieve the highest level of consensus amongst the judges, and that's what we got, 15-2, 15-2, 15-2, 1 on each of the provisional measures, which demonstrates the strength of this order, right? Because as we saw, Israel and the United States and its allies immediately did what anybody should do with these legal decisions, and they spun it as their own victory. And had the consensus been lower, they would have spun that as well. So I just want to emphasize that this was actually a very strong decision that we need to leverage in order to use as a tool, if not to charge Israel with genocide, certainly to demand the means to impose an immediate ceasefire, which we needed yesterday. Okay. So, and, you know, and that, and I'll get into that, even if the court came out with a more strident ruling, it doesn't have the authority to enforce it. That authority is still our purview. It's the work that we do in our national governments. It's the work that residents of Chile, I just met a young woman from Chile, when Chile and Mexico refer Israel to the ICC. It's the work of nationals in the Netherlands who sue their government not to sell F-35 jet parts to Israel in light of this decision. It's the work of Japanese nationals who work to cut military contracts with Elbit because they could be in violation of the Genocide Convention. This remains our work. The court couldn't have done it anything else. And that's, I know a lot of people also had a lot of faith in the court because nothing seems to be working, which is another commentary about international law itself, but I kind of wrote a book on that. So I'll just, but in any case, this is going to be even harder to prove at the merit stage than it is now. Based on jurisprudence in Bosnia versus Serbia, Right? Which, by the way, is also quite disappointing. In Bosnia versus Serbia, the court ruled and decided in that case that of all of the massacres that took place against Bosnian Muslims, only the massacre at Srebrenica constituted a genocide. And even then, it constituted a genocide by the VRA. By, force, by independent forces of the VRA, for which the government of Serbia was not responsible. So even then, their findings said that Serbia is only culpable for not 
preventing or punishing genocide, but not actually for committing it. But they set another standard that's not helpful, which is a very high standard that the purpose that there, there has to be a smoking gun. You have to actually find a plan that says kill them all, right? Um, and this, for a lot of historians in the room, I'm at Georgetown CCAS historians, this comes up in the historiography of Palestine as well, because there was never a smoking gun besides a few operations like LID that actually had the orders to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. And so it remained contentious for many decades, right? Until military files became accessible to other historians where we can see more. So this is not just unique to the law as a discipline. But the law says that the intent to destroy in whole or in part a protected group can only be inferred from, quote, a pattern of conduct that is where the only reasonable inference, the only, the only reasonable inference that can be drawn therefrom is destruction. And here you can draw a lot of inferences, as Israel will argue. All right. Now, how do we, to just get into it, how could we, Push back. I know for a lot of students of Palestine and Palestinian studies, this seems obvious, and it is. Because if we draw on the history, it illuminates a lot for us. And I'm going to do that now in my next part of the talk, okay? I'm going to spare you of the detail of Israel's arguments and take them to a level of abstraction to summarize them as two arguments. The first argument that Israel makes is that they are not targeting Palestinians because of who they are, but because of what they did, right? not because of who they are, which would be destruction of a people, but because of what they did, the attack on October 7th, all right? And the second argument is that if, and this is just war theory, not necessarily humanitarian law, just war theory says that if a, camp, if a military campaign is legitimate, then all the means used to destroy or to achieve your military advantage thereafter is also legitimate. Hence, the U.S. is never held to account for the bombing, the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? So there's this idea that if the, if the purpose is legitimate, then we can stomach the carnage because it's, it's, it's a noble cause. Let me respond to both of those arguments, all right? Drawing on Palestine studies, which is why knowledge production is so important. So in response to the first question, let me just start with the evidence on the ground. The evidence raises a different presumption. 27,000 Palestinians have been killed at an average of 117 a day. That doesn't include those that are still missing under the rubble. 40% of those are children. That doesn't include the children who have had one or two limbs amputated. 10 children have one or two limbs amputated every day, now without anesthesia. 1.9 Palestinians are internally displaced. 250,000 homes have been totally or partially destroyed. All of the 35 hospitals have been attacked. 326 schools, all of the four major universities have been leveled to the ground. 247 mosques, three churches, 199 heritage sites, 1,690 factories, libraries, cultural centers, bakeries, even 16 cemeteries have been bulldozed. New words have been created to describe the level of this destruction. Epistemicide, scholasticide, uh, domicide. As put by Professor Shirin Say Ali, quote, any honest observer of this war understands that the target of Israeli force and its U.S. supplied weapons is the Palestinian civilian. Hamas combatants are the collateral damage. Israel does not dispute these numbers, but wants to cast them as Hamas's responsibility for shielding. I'll get into this. I'll get into this. But let me just say now that one of the things that we've also heard Israelis say a lot right, is that all of these are members of Hamas that makes them targets. And, and they're doing this deliberately, right, because they're insisting that they're part of a political group. But in international law, humanitarian law, how, whatever we want to say about it, your ideas, whatever you think, whatever you believe in, you can believe in devils flying on unicorns, you know, firing uh, lava from the sky, 
it doesn't change your civilian status. Your civilian status is altered when you take up arms, when you fight, not even when you aid the war effort as a medic or a cook or a driver, but when you take up arms and you become a combatant who can be killed. Otherwise, you are a civilian. So this argument is absolutely irrelevant and is totally banking on racist concepts of Muslims and Arabs and specifically Palestinians. What about um, the other part I told you about the ICJ, I should mention this, rejected this argument because they recognize Palestinians as a national group. Done with this argument. It's not a political group, they're a national group. That's the other thing the ICJ did. But if we look into Palestine studies, we see more that Israel is actually targeting Palestinians because of who they are. They've been targeting Palestinians because of who they are, regardless of what they do, period. Israel has constructed the native population as inherently terrorist, presumed guilty by virtue of its refusal to disappear and its refusal to surrender their claims of sovereignty. Thus, Palestinians are racialized as dangerous, not because of how they may individually harm Israelis, but because their national existence challenges Israel's settler sovereignty. Consider, for example, very blatantly and in front of our eyes right now, how the right of return of Palestinian refugees is constructed as an existential threat to Israel. They didn't do anything but exist, but exist. But the use of violence and the logic of collective punishment against Palestinians has underpinned Israel's military strategy since the founding years of the state, even in cases where they pose no military threat. Plan Dalit. For example, sanction the targeting of Palestinian and Plan Dalit, by the way, emerges two months before the establishment of Israel. So this is carried out by Zionist militias before the advent of an actual Arab-Israeli war, right? This wasn't in the fog of war. Um, we could talk more about that if you want, what, at what moment it happens and what's going on in the Security Council that rebuffs the partition plan. But look, let's look at the language of this as jurists would, okay? Plan Dalit sanctioned the targeting of Palestinian villages accused of providing assistance to Palestinian militants or that might serve as strategic basis for attack in the name of achieving a defensive system. It authorized the destruction of villages. It authorized not only the wiping out of armed forces, but that populations where those armed forces were found must be expelled. This is what produces the forced exile and removal of Palestinians that we know as Nekba. But later, upon Israel's establishment, the first act of Israeli government was to adopt almost verbatim Britain, colonial Britons, the mandates, emergency regime. And this regime was applied to Palestinians during the Great Revolt between 36 to 39 to crush it, that basically suspends the rule of law in order to mobilize military law to suspend the right to assembly, the right to press, to uh, permit administrative detention, the imposition of curfews, a restriction of movement, martial law, right? When Israel and, they, and, and the British crush the revolt in this way, right? They decimate some... Um, the, the ability of Palestinians to even fight later between 47 and 49. But when Israel is established, it adopts this emergency regime and applies it only to Palestinians. Under So it's very racial application, not to all of its citizens, but only to the Palestinians that stayed. And it does so, initially it tells us because they're worried that they might fight back or be a force within, hiding amongst them. But within a year of the emergency regime, a military commission that reviewed it said that these Palestinians that stayed, who they call Arab, obviously, these Arabs that stayed posed no threat so that we can lift it. And founding Prime Minister Ben-Gurion refused, explaining that the purpose of the martial law regime was necessary to expand Jewish Zionist settlement, plainly explaining, quote, the military regime came to existence to protect the right of Jewish settlement in all parts of the state. And that martial law regime, that emergency regime lasted for another um, 18 years. 
another 18 years until 1966 when it was lifted and then applied to the West Bank and Gaza, where it remains applied. Okay? So we know that even without Palestinians doing anything, they have been racialized as inherently dangerous. All right. But the securitization of Palestinians becomes ensconed in police and military discourse in the early 2000s. Since the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, Israel began to develop legal technologies that would allow it to use a greater amount of military force against the population that it occupied. This is what I call in my work, this legal technology, the shrinking civilian. They're not shrinking Palestinians into smaller and smaller size. They're shrinking the category of who counts as a civilian in the language of law. And they do that in many, many ways, in peacetime and in, in, in what they would call hostilities time. And they're making up new laws to make this happen, right? Because you can't use military force against the population that it occupied. You've already usurped their law enforcement function. You have the duty to protect and to police them, to maintain law and order. Right. So now they're blurring those lines. So there's no distinction between hostilities and peacetime. Well, one of the technologies that they used to do in hostilities is this concept of the direct participant of host in hostilities. So under international law, any civilian that picks up arms who's not part of a formal army is a legitimate target for the time that they are picking up arms. They are no longer a target when they put those arms down. Well, in 2006, the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel sued the government of Israel. This is an Israeli human rights organization, sued the government of Israel saying, you can't do that. You can't just target Palestinians anytime, even when they're not picking up arms. And the high court, their Supreme Court, which everyone is up in arms about that now is becoming oppressive, said no. Palestinian combatants who put their uh, weapons down have a continuous combat function. So even if they're not fighting, they're still legitimate targets, be they sleeping in their home with their families or on a beach at a picnic. They become legitimate targets. So that's one way that we shrink the, uh, the, the, the category of civilian. But I can tell you a bunch of other ways if you want to ask me in Q&A, but believe it or not, I have a lot to go. So. I will keep it moving, okay? Another one is in peacetime during the Great March of Return, but really, really ask me questions. All right, let me move on to the second argument. This is the Nakba, which is so relevant today, and I'm gonna, it's going to keep coming up. All right, not here yet. Let me just stay on Nakba. Second argument, if the attack is legitimate, then all means of warfare are legitimate. First of all, no. There's laws of war, so that's not true. Um, but let's just take this just war theory for what it is and evaluate whether or not Israel's campaign is legitimate. Okay, let's take it at face value. Is it legitimate? Note that Israel insists that Hamas's attack on October 7th constitutes an armed attack within the language of international law. Article 51 of the UN Charter is the only exception to the use of force by a state against another entity anywhere. Okay. It's an exception to Article 2.4, which protects the territorial and political integrity of any other state. So in the UN Charter definition of self-defense, an armed attack gives another state the right to use force in response. When the United States was attacked by Al-Qaeda in 2001, that law changes. The Security Council adopts resolutions 1368 and 1373, which recognizes that non-state actors can actually launch armed attacks, giving a state the right to respond using military force. Otherwise, how do you respond to terrorists? Police, law enforcement, yes? And in this case, this, the law changes in 2001. And so Israel tries to adopt, and then they attack Afghanistan um, because it's unable or unwilling to actually um, clamp down on Al-Qaeda itself. And so Israel, tries to use the same argument to say that because of Palestinian terrorists, all Palestinian use of force is terroristic, um, according to Israel, that because of the, those constitute armed attacks and therefore Israel has the right to use force in response. Seems like it makes sense, right? Jurisprudence lines up, everything seems to line up. But no, as a matter of law, Israel has no such right to armed force against the territory that it occupies. This prohibition was 
uh, affirmed by the International Court of Justice in its advisory opinion in 2004, which explained, all right, read it yourself and I'll, and I'll summarize it, that an armed attack that would trigger Article 51 must be attributable to a sovereign state. So in the case of Al-Qaeda, it was attributable to a sovereign state. Here, who would you attribute the armed attack to? None other than Israel, the occupying power, which usurped those policing functions. So Israel usurped that sovereignty and has a duty and a responsibility to protect the civilians under its occupation until the reversion of sovereignty. That means that any insecurity and disorder within the occupied territory is attributable to the occupying power itself rather than a foreign state. And the proper level of, uh, level of force in that situation is regulated by oc occupation law rather than the laws of war. So what is the difference? One is law enforcement. What, how do law enforcement, you all know, well, police, you know, I guess we have a lot to say about police, but police are not supposed to use lethal force as a measure of first resort. They're supposed to shoot at the ground, shoot beneath the knee, shoot beneath the waist, shoot above the waist, shoot above the neck in, in some sort of sequence. But lethal force is the last measure of resort. Unlike in warfare, where lethal force can be your first measure of resort, shoot in the head, shoot in the neck, shoot in the chest and in the back, all right? And so here's what's at contest. Israel does not have the right to military force, but does have the right to that police force. However, however, again, Palestine studies, because Israel desires Palestinian land without its people, it has insisted that there's actually no sovereign in the West Bank in Gaza. There's no people. In 1967, when it occupied the territory, it said that Egypt never laid claim to the Gaza Strip, and Jordan, which laid claim to the West Bank, that sovereignty was never recognized except for by the UK and Pakistan. And so their claim is not legitimate, which means, and Palestinians don't exist. So which means that there's no sovereign. This is the missing reversioner argument. And so Israel's claim to sovereignty is just as good as anybody other, anyone else's claims to sovereignty. Israel describes the West Bank in Gaza as sui generis, Latin for unlike anything else. It is unique. There is no similar fact pattern because here's a territory without a sovereign. Therefore, it gives Israel the right to create new law where it insists no law already exists. So they don't, Israel doesn't regard West Bank and Gaza as occupied. I feel like I'm in class right now. What do they regard it as? Huh? I heard it. Did somebody say disputed? Let's just go with it. Yes. Disputed territory. Israel describes the West Bank and Gaza as disputed territory, not occupied territory. To the extent that they've applied occupation law, they'd have applied it on a de facto basis of, uh, uh, on its own, as a matter of fact, but not as a matter of law. Why would Israel do that? Because on a de facto basis, it gives Israel the right, it legitimizes its presence in the West Bank in Gaza without making it follow the letter of the law. So they don't have to adhere to Article 49, subsection 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which says that you cannot settle civilians in territory that you occupy because that would indicate a permanent presence and occupation is meant to be short term in nature. But Israel insists it's disputed. It's de facto application. And so this law doesn't apply to it. Under this exceptional framework, Israel shifted from a framework of occupation to warfare at the start of the Second Intifada. Its military lawyers described in 2000 that the Palestinian uprising was more than a civilian disturbance. It wasn't a riot. But that which would be regulated by law enforcement, nor was it an armed conflict represented by a nascent sovereign, an embryonic sovereign of a Palestinian people who are fighting for their freedom. The, instead, Israel argued that this was sui generis, unlike anything else. And they created a new law called the law armed conflict short of war. Armed conflict short of war. 
What does that do? It allowed Israel to create new law where law already existed, specifically in the first and second additional protocols of 1977 to the Geneva Convention, which regulates warfare between states and non-state actors, either as an international armed conflict between non-state actors who are embryonic sovereigns, say, I don't know, of South African, the ANC, or the SWAPO of Namibia, right, or the FLN of Algeria, right? There's a nascent sovereign. They are fighting as a people and represent a government, international armed conflict, although the FLN precedes this and, and get their independent, uh, Algeria is independent before, or it's a non-international armed conflict, which is tantamount to civil war. But Israel doesn't want to argue that there's a civil war because then it would have to argue that these Palestinians live under its authority. But if these Palestinians live under its authority, how come they don't have the right to vote? That's awkward. Or, and they don't want to argue that Palestinians are actually a nascent sovereign because then they would have to recognize that Palestinians are a people. Okay? So they create armed conflict short of war. And under this precedent, we get the blurring of Israel is allowed to administer occupation, featuring administrative detention, curfews, restriction on movement, collective punishment, restrictions on speech and assembly, and warfare, featuring extrajudicial assassinations and aerial missile strikes, where the Palestinians cannot fight back at all. They can't target a soldier. They can't target a tank. They certainly can't target people. Under all laws, they cannot target civilians. So this doesn't forgive Palestinians and give them expansive rights either. But in this case, we're criminalizing any Palestinian use of force ipso facto before they even use it. Wait, there's more. Upon Israel's unilateral disengagement from Gaza in 2005, when it removed 9,000 settlers and the military infrastructure of settlement, Israel declared yet another exception. Gaza was, can we play this game again? Sui generis, actually. Sorry. Gaza is sui generis, unlike anything else. It was no longer occupied, but it wasn't independent either. It was a, they gave it a new name. They called it a hostile entity. Okay? Now, obviously, there is some law. Thank God. There's some... <laughs> And this is the ICC decision of 2014. This is dicta that had to do with uh, uh, a flotilla that was commandeered by Israeli naval commandos. Here, the International Criminal Court rejects the jurisdiction of the case, but also rules that Gaza is still under effective control because Israel controls its airspace, its sea space, all points of ingress and egress in cooperation with Egypt, the, also the point of ingress of egress of Rafah, as well as the underwater aquifers, as well as the population registry and the electromagnetic sphere, they are, effective, they are in effective control. They are an occupying power. Occupation law still applies. And so when we say that Israel does not have the right to self-defense in law, we're not saying that it can't defend itself, but it can't use the language of law to defend itself where it can use this military force. If it wants to defend its civilians, one, it should just end its occupation, period. End the occupation. A principle of state responsibility is you state cannot negotiate the consequences of its acts if those acts are illegal. And yet here is what we're bearing witness to. So let's just keep emphasizing this. But second, if it were to use, if it were to use defensive force, it would still have to do so within the bounds of law enforcement in this case because it exercises effective control. Okay, so just know, just know that what Israel is facing is not unprecedented. It actually has a lot of precedent. The majority of wars between the end of Second World War and the present have not been between two states. They've been between states and non-state actors. So it's certainly not unprecedented. And secondly, we also know that Israeli, that, that one, they're innovating new laws in order to shrink who's a civilian. So they admit to all these killings, but basically don't admit their civilian status and are you all might think that this is just force, right? Might makes right. They're engaging in legal argument. They're engaging in legal argument that I can get into, but I'll, I'll spare you for now because I have one more section. Um, and 
um, we know that they also admit to violations of IHL and crimes against humanity. In any case, what about the legitimacy then of the operation? What about the legitimacy of the operation? Let's say they're not gonna they're not gonna abide by any of this precedent or any of these laws, even absent the red lines imposed by humanitarian law for the past now five months, Israel is nowhere closer to achieving its stated military goals. Not what it wants to do, but what it told us it was going to do. It said it wanted to decimate Hamas, that it wanted to extract its, um, its captives and save its, uh, its, its hostages. And those are two different categories, right? The security captives versus the civilian hostages have different status under international law. It did neither of those things except for two um, uh, uh, last week. And it wants to turn the Palestinian population in popular revolt against Hamas. They're doing a great job, right? Um, not only has Israel not turned the Palestinians against Hamas, they've made Hamas far more popular amongst Palestinians, amongst the Arab world, and even according to U.S. intelligence internationally. They're defeating their purpose. When Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says Israel might win the battle, but it's losing the war strategically. This is what he's talking about. They're losing this war strategically. Second, what about extracting its soldiers, extracting its um, captives and rescuing its hostages? They extracted and, re and returned them through diplomatic negotiations far more effectively than they have through their military combat. That's empirical evidence. And they can't say that because of the war, they made Hamas more compliant in negotiations because Hamas told us on day one, we'll give the civilians back. They didn't, we want to keep the security uh, captives. And three, what about decimating Hamas? Well, Hamas is still shooting rockets from the middle of Gaza City. Apparently has enough homemade weapons for several more months. And only 20 to 30 percent of its fighters have been killed. So they're not doing a great job, even without any red lines. I said this recently, so but I'll say it again here. Either they just don't know how to fight. They're too busy making TikToks. Right. Or or that's not what they're trying to achieve. They're not, that's not, they're telling us, this, they're telling us this is their military goal, but that's not really what they're trying to achieve. In fact, what they're trying to achieve is what I've described as something known as Nekba peace, establishing peace through Nekba or depopulation. And Israelis do not disagree. Former Shin Bet director and national security member Avi Dichter explained in November. Quote, we are now rolling out a Gaza Nekba. Gaza Nekba 2023, that is how it will end. This logic says that the proximity of Gaza, inhabited by 2.3 million Palestinians, two-thirds of whom are refugees seeking to return to their original homes in present-day Israel, makes the entirety of Gaza and its population, civilian and otherwise, a threat that needs to be removed or permanently subdued. Accordingly, Israel has insisted that to achieve its military purpose of sustainable self-defense, it should not be subject to red lines of combat and is within its sovereign right to remove the Palestinian population and prevent their return. This goal has been captured in public three times to date. A leaked document dated October 13, penned by an Israeli government research agency, de detailed such removal as yielding, quote, positive long-term strategic outcomes for Israel. Another document penned by the Misgav Institute for National Security and Zionist Strategy explained that it presented, quote, a unique and rare opportunity to evacuate the whole Gaza Strip in coordination with the Egyptian government, end quote. And most recently, a far-right coalition of Israeli ministers convened a conference titled Settlement, Bring Security and Victory. This idea has historical precedence. This is the Elon plan penned by Giora Elon in the early 2000s. Um, this plan competed with the plan for unilateral disengagement. In the end of the second intifada, Israel was fatigued and realized that the occupation you know, that was directed completely by Israel was too expensive. Politically, public relations wise, militarily, its civilians, its own citizens didn't like it, right? And so there were two competing ideas, the Elon plan 
which is to depopulate the Palestinians in Gaza to the Egypt, or unilateral disengagement, Ariel Sharon's proposal. Unilateral disengagement pre prevails, as we know now, but this planted the seed for what we're seeing today. Now we are witnessing a Nakba featuring the removal, exclusion, and colonial settlement of the Gaza Strip framed as necessary for Israel's durable security as an exclusivist Zionist sovereign. The recent ICJ decision concluding that Israel is plausibly advancing a genocide is part of the effort to reject Israel's argument that it has a right to do this. Israel is making an exception, another sui generis exception, that depopulation is necessary. Nobody else has faced this before, except ask any other settler colony, right? Um, the Nekba committed in the shadows. And here's, here's why I think the ICJ won't be able to respond to this. We even, we see it's so plain. It's so plain, right? So why wouldn't the ICJ be able to look at this evidence, be able to say, but wait a minute, you're not targeting Palestinians because of what they did, but because of who they are. You've been doing that since before the establishment of the state itself. And why is it that you've actually changed these laws in order to remove Palestinians that this isn't, this isn't a legitimate warfare. This is, a, uh, this is an ethnic, ethnic cleansing plot project of elimination in the settler colonial sense, right? Why would the ICJ not be able to reach that? Because the Nakba is naturalized in international law. It's become accepted. How did it become accepted? It was committed in the shadows of the drafting of the Genocide Convention and Palestinians were excluded from its scope. Whose self determination was forcefully, Palestinians whose self determination was forcefully thwarted could not accede to the newly drafted convention. They couldn't sign on to the convention. There was no Palestine. And Israel, viewed as genocide's canonical victims, could not be conceived as the first accused genocider. Right? But more, the international community normalized the Nakba, accepted Israel's claim for legal exception from well established law. The newly established United Nations had the opportunity to condition Israel's UN membership on the return of Palestinian refugees, but failed to do so. The international community treated, quote, the new, according to Professor Ardemsis, treated the new state of Israel as a fait accompli, despite emerging through clear violations even of the terms of Resolution 181, Partition 1947, as well as international humanitarian and human rights law, and transformed Palestinian refugees into a humanitarian issue whose fate would be determined through political negotiations. The international community further normalized ne Nekba in the following decades, particularly in UN Security Council Resolution 242 and the crystallized consensus for a two-state solution predicated on the removal and forced exile of native Palestinians. International law accepts Nakba as legal, even though if we were, if there was a, you know, to apply retroactively the law, we would find that it was also a form of ethnic cleansing and genocide. So today Israel is continuing that tradition of exception insisting that its military campaign is justifiably pursued in the for the purpose of ethnic cleansing, and though it may seem genocidal to all of us, that it's actually necessary for its sustainable and long-term security. This logic says that the proximity of Gaza inhabited by 2.3 million, uh, million Palestinians, who are uh, two-thirds of whom are seeking return, make the entirety of Gaza and its population a threat, a threat today, their babies will be a threat. Later, they'll want to return. They will always be a threat. So these controversies are unlikely to be resolved by the ICJ, especially a court that understands Resolution 181 and 242, as well as a clear diplomatic consensus for the two-state solution as constituting the normalization of the presence of Israel on the 1949 armistice lines, and thus the Nakba itself is beyond legal contestation. It's what um, scholar Rabia Agbariya, legal scholar Rabia Agbariya says, we need to enter Nakba into the legal lexicon in order so we could see it, because now it's legal, right? Even... This forthcoming case on February 19th about the legality of the status of the West Bank in Gaza will further normalize Nakba because it's only about the West Bank in Gaza. So in sum, the court 
might not be able to adequately resolve this question for us. So let me tell you now, six to 13 years ahead of time, do not hold your breath. Do not wait for them to save you. No one will save you. No one will save us. That is our job. So on a hopeful note, I'm going to end on a hopeful note. Can you believe it? I think, um, and it's really hard to be hopeful in these dismal times, very dark times, where we're basically bearing witness to watch what powerful states are doing right before our eyes. And, and punishing us for protesting against it, for trying to save our humanity, we get punished. Students are being suspended. Other students are being attacked with chemical weapons. Other students are being run over by cars. Protests, our only Palestinian American representative in Congress is being censored by her diplomatic, uh, by her democratic counterparts for just naming what we see. So it's a horrific time. Because if they can do this to Palestinians, trust, they can do this to anyone else that they want to. Right? So what's at stake is all of us. All of us. So Nancy Pelosi, who thinks that Russia and China are controlling us, really doesn't understand how human we are. And that we are fighting for our lives and the lives of our children and their children. And I have hope in that future. I have hope in this rebellious, rebellious generation. High school students are organizing walkouts. High school students who, you know, probably don't look up from their phones or their memes are literally organizing walkouts right now. For them, the polls are showing us that 67% of young people between the ages of 18 and 35 oppose this genocide. They demand ceasefire. 64% of people of color who recognize this in their ancestors and in their bodies oppose genocide and demand ceasefire. That is irrefutable. They are telling us that we failed them. The adults in the room failed them. We failed them on gender. We're fighting over bathrooms when we should be dignifying all human life. We failed them on gun reform and parents are afraid to send their children to school because that's dangerous. We failed them on racial justice because we still have impunity for the killing of black people in the United States and banning books. You have to sign permission slips in Florida to read a book authored by an African-American. If I were a kid, I wouldn't trust any of us. And they don't trust us on this either. We got this one wrong too, but that is the future. They are inheriting this earth, what scorched parts of it we're leaving them. They are inheriting this earth. And I believe, I believe that we have witnessed a generational shift. And I believe in that generational shift, that they will make radical things happen. They will look back at this moment and remember all of you in the kafiyas and all of you at the protests and all of you who are writing and all of you who taught your babies to chant. They will remember that we fought for them and rewrite a history of this moment that the contemporary moment has failed to write accurately. And for that, I'm very hopeful. Thank you.
Can everyone? Can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, I'm just. I was just sitting up here as eye candy. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just start off with one question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, and just remind everyone, if you could just keep, please keep your comments to a question, and we have mics on either side. I'll give you a second to oh, no, take I, a breath. I, you gave me a free pen, and I really like that. So. <laughs> so thank you so much, Nora. Um, that was super informative, uh, inspiring. Um, I know this is a difficult time and you're being constantly tasked with speaking and, and we appreciate you making the time to be with us here. And you know, you started out and you kind of ended up on that, like can relate, you started out by talking about the fact that the ICJ is not gonna do this for us, we need to do this for us, right? You kind of ended up talking about that kind of action. And I wonder if you could speak to this question of kind of the utility of international law in relation to that, right? And we, I oh, just yeah. taught your book today and we were talking about this. We didn't get a chance to completely flush this out, right? Do you, do you still, yeah. So given, given the limits of law, what, what's the utility of law? Absolutely. Like in all of this, can you speak to that a little bit? It's yeah. a tool. Yeah. It's a tool. Have no fidelity to the law. The law is indeterminate. Okay, you can have the same law. So I'll give you an example. All right, I'll give you an example. In 19, in 1920, self-determination, basically in the words of Professor Timothy Mitchell, only referred to the consent of the governed. Did the native peoples consent to their mandatory power to govern them? That was what self-determination meant right in the aftermath of the First World War. But by 1960, Self-determination meant something completely different, right? It now meant that colonialism was an illegitimate form of governance. It meant a right to self-government. It meant a right to full and complete sovereignty, right? It meant a right to national liberation. It's not that it was now re-legislated and they rewrote the law, but the law changed meaning across time because of the political work, the balance of historical, material, economic realities. And particularly in 1960, we see the coming together of many, um, uh, colonized peoples and newly liberated peoples who had basically created, you know, consolidated their power in the non-aligned movement, right? Unity is power. And so we see the law change across time. What about right now? What about right now? Right now, I, I, for example, have written since 2015 why, and I didn't, y'all, I was going to talk about the ICG and the ICC. Y'all, you would have been here for a whole semester. <laughs> I spared you. Um, but uh, the ICC I've been writing since 2015 is horribly flawed. We see it now, obviously. You see it now. Kareem Khan is not, has already visited the families of, of survivors of October 7th and has yet to visit Palestinians, even though... Juris we've been asking for jurisdiction since 2015. That took six years. The case has been open since 2021. And he hasn't visited, right? And I've been so critical of the ICC and all my partners in the legal field. Don't go to the ICC. If you go to the ICC, they're going to prosecute Hamas anyway first. And they probably won't even prosecute Israel. Or they'll prosecute him on a small operation and not what you really want, right? But I was part of a legal team that actually filed an ICC petition. Why would I do that? Because I wanted to help mainstream the concept of genocide. It was a tool. It was a tactic. Once we filed that petition at the criminal court, I could care less what Khan is going to do at this point. Right now, I needed people to understand. I wanted to be part of the effort for people to understand that this was a genocide. It created controversy. It created media opportunity. And we did it. We did it. Same thing with this ICJ decision. I don't have a lot of hope for it at the merit stage, but we needed to do it because not to prove that Israel is, is committing genocide. We know it is. We don't need a tribunal to tell us. Peoples tell us. The survivors tell us, right? But it was necessary in this moment because we need a ceasefire. And it's helping to mobilize for a ceasefire as it's being used as a tool. 
So most people think about use the law because here's what the court does. And then you have a police force enforce the laws. But in international law, there is no police. So you have to think about what else is the law doing? How is it shaping our imaginations? How is it shaping members of the foreign uh, ministries of, of different countries or the uh, foreign affairs officers of the Department of Defense, right? How are we shaping the way that they're thinking? That's what language of law is doing, even if it's not actually regulating state behavior or punishing it. So I do think that it's a tool. And I, I'm a movement lawyer. And so I think that you use the law in the service of political movement. And if there is no movement, definitely don't use the law. But right now there's robust movement, so robust that I tell my colleagues, including now members of the, I'm so excited, my friends are, are members of the South African legal team. Um, it was because of you all that they brought the case. And I believe that. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna, I have plenty of questions, but I wanna give the audience a chance to ask questions. So I'm gonna invite folks to come up to the mic. Oh, you're curious. <laughs> yeah, if you're ready for us. Hi, my name is Marina. I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service. Um, and I'm wondering, based on your contention that Palestinian, Palestinian militants are fighting for their freedom, and also as a human rights lawyer, do you consider rape of the sort that was clearly documented in the New York Times reports on the Hamas attacks on October 7th and then celebrated or entirely dismissed all over social media to be a legitimate form of resistance? Um, so I will start by saying that I believe rape in any context is absolutely deplorable. Absolutely deplorable as a human, regardless of my expertise. And I believe that sexual assault and violence is an endemic feature of armed conflict and military situations. So I believe that it exists and I believe that it's completely possible. I also want to push back a little bit on what you said, that that same New York Times report and article has been debunked and the family of the woman, I don't wanna, wait, 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 no, no, really, really. This is no, I, let's just take this seriously. So it doesn't feel like we can't talk about it. I'm not trying to score a point with you. I'd like you to revisit that New York Times article. It has been debunked. And in fact, what we're finding is that we wanna believe survivors, but there actually are no survivors who have told us that they've been raped. And that the evidence that we have had available to us has been not at all what you say as irrefutable. Otherwise, it would have been more clear to us. I've read the Physicians for Human Rights Israel report, and there there's not a single case. In fact, it's all conjecture that they're giving us, kind of like the conjecture I gave you at the start of my talk, right? And that the families of those who said that they were raped said, no, they weren't. So what's, and then even the stories, the women, the hostages that were released all said they were afraid of being raped, but none of them were. They would have told us. So of course I wouldn't celebrate it. And I don't celebrate it. And no one is celebrating it. There is a pushback and an ask for thorough investigations because we've seen two trends very clearly. We've seen the demonization of Palestinians and the mobilization of disinformation used that's proven false later in order to justify more killing of Palestinians, including the fact that there were no 40 babies beheaded, including the fact that there wasn't a command and control center under the Shifa hospital. And yet based on that false information that our president repeated, thousands of Palestinian children have been killed. So it is incumbent upon us to be thorough and scrutinizing. And the second is, if we are serious about sexual violence in the context of armed conflict, then we must take seriously the sexual violence endured by Palestinian women, men, and children in Israeli captivity 
that has been well documented. And so I'm with you. I'm with you. But we have to be clear across the board of what we're dealing with. So. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is John. I'm a culture and politics junior, junior from Georgetown, Qatar. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, a, an argument brought up by a lawyer, uh, Michael Sapard. Um, he said that international law tends to take away resources from other forms of resistance, uh -huh. like, for example, armed resistance or nonviolent protest. Um, have you ever felt that your efforts have like directed attention or the spotlight away from other forms of resistance? I know you're a lawyer. You believe in the rule of law. And you might yeah. not believe in armed resistance. So have you ever felt that you were taking away the voice of someone who has been resisting through their own way? Thank you for that great question. I would have to, you know, I've been very reflective in this moment because I do think I've taken up a lot of space. And so what space am I taking up at what point? And sometimes I have to think is someone, you know, there's a do. sometimes it's a duty. This is different from what you're asking. I'm just reflecting. Um, sometimes it's a duty, and if there's other times, I, I, I do refer a lot of people and use this as an opportunity to encourage others to try to get up in front of, 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 of media. It's a very particular skill set, right, in that sense. What about this question about law and the, and the um, diversion of resources? I actually had that thought when the ICJ decision came about, right? I don't know if you all noticed, but there were, there's been several phases of, of this past few months. In the first phase, we were just in shock. Lots of information was coming out. We don't know what's true, what's not true. All of us are being, you know, pushed into a corner, basically told that we are, you know, Palestinians are barbarians and savages. Then we saw the second phase of more information is coming out. Now it's telling us more about what actually happened on October 7th, but we also saw a ceasefire and the conversation shifted to be about prisoners, captivity, occupation. Palestinians are hostages, right? And then the conversation shifted to the law. Once South Africa filed its petition on December 29th, 2023, the conversation became completely you know, dominated by legal specialists, right? Suddenly people who have, didn't say anything about Palestinians or their right to live or survive were the experts telling us about ICJ jurisprudence, the laws of war, what they think the court is going to say. And in that moment, I was really frustrated because I felt, wow, I felt like I was watching a moot court as opposed to watching, you know, trying to stop a genocide. Um, and so I do think in that moment, we did suffer from that. And part of what I've been trying to do is to push back because this, this isn't a legal question. That's going to be written later, right? And, and jurists never agree anyway. They're never going to settle this. Um, and so it, there is a risk. Um, and I think that we have to do our part to avoid that risk, and especially for movement attorneys, which I think Center for Constitutional Rights are, and they've brought the other case in the United States. Um, they've emphasized that this remains a power of the people. So there's risk. We have to avoid it. Hi. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for your time and for being so thoughtful with all your responses. Um, I wanted to ask you, I know, I love what you're saying about how the law really is just a tool because for a lot of us, it has felt like the law is woefully ill-prepared to deal with what we're seeing. And in fact, a lot of times they're working against what like the public trend is, um, in, in terms of sentiment. But I wondered, I have been doing a lot of just kind of reading and research into the education system and the curriculum in Israeli schools. And I wondered from a judicial perspective and also from a kind of public perception perspective, if you think that the curriculum in Israeli schools and in for like Israeli children has any bearing in terms of being somewhat of that smoking gun and mm. establishing intent to commit genocide. Hmm. That's a good point. I'll refer that to the legal team <laughs> uh, to take a look at. I don't study the Israeli curriculum, and I won't speak on what I don't know, but I will refer to a scholar named Nurit Pelled, 
who has studied, the, she's an Israeli who has studied the Israeli uh, curriculum, who has an entire chapter on how Palestinians have basically been Nazified amongst Israelis in Israeli society. I'll also comment on other things that we do know, which is that Israel is really, really unique globally because its younger generation is actually more conservative than its elder generation. Usually it's the opposite. And so the, the next ge Israeli generation actually is, is promising to be more conservative and right wing than this one that exists, which is very scary. So is that, is that the education system? Perhaps. But is it also a lack of accountability? Absolutely. Absolutely. Palestinians' homes have been demolished. Settlers um, attack, spit on people, attack children, right? Harm with, with no accountability. I mean, you live in a society that glorifies this kind of violence against the people. And don't think that Israel is unique. We live in a racial settler colony. This country, this country maintained the racial subordination of black communities through lynchings that were public, that were waged by vigilantes, that were just not held to any account. So this kind of society is not unique to Israel, right? But does give us a, a bit of an idea about what the lack of impunity does. And what, when somebody says, but it's our sovereign right, is our right to do it. Yeah, but sovereignty has limits. Apartheid is not a legitimate sovereign, a sovereignty framework. So this is where we need to push back, yeah. I think this is what people are in arms about, right? I think sovereignty is forever in contest. So we've seen it, we've seen it take one, there's tenuous sovereignty for smaller countries that don't really get to exercise it, but who always, you know, who whose sovereignty is always contested. Think of Ethiopia, the first African nation that gets accepted into the League of Nations, gets attacked by, you know, Mussolini um, in order to occupy it. And why are they attacked? They're 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 because they're uncivilized, they're practicing slavery, right? And so the sovereignty that gets contested. We see it again. Whose sovereignty is contested that it gets permeate, um, you know, violated because of the responsibility to protect? It's not the United States. It's not the United States because of lynching, but it is Libya, right? And then now we see a contest of sovereignty. We see Israel saying that it's its sovereign right to have an exclusive Jewish state with a, you know, a formidable demographic Jewish majority, and that is its sovereign right. But we also have white nationalists who are telling us the same thing. When Richard Spencer says that Israel is a model for the future of European sovereignty. So we need not stop at the bounds of sovereignty, but to contest and poke at it. Poke at it. And these things are always in contest. My question is regarding um, recent U.S. sanctions that have been imposed on um, dual citizens, U.S. Israeli citizens who are um, found to be conducting violence um, while settling in the West Bank. Um, you spoke about normalizing Nekba in the legal lexicon. How, we, how may um, sovereign states like the U.S. normalize um, sanctions and push back against the narrative of the West Bank being a disputed territory, but rather an occupied territory, and how may states further normalize sanctions against not just settlers who are dual citizens who commit acts of violence, but anybody who is settling in the West Bank illegally? How can how can we normalize? How can what are the limits of international law in normalizing sanctions against settlers in the West Bank? Okay. Excellent question. This, we're doing, uh, sh you know, strategy talk, right? How do we do this? Let me first say that as far as I understand, the U.S. didn't sanction dual citizens. It can't. Americans are exempt. So that's the first thing that I've understood, which is, you know, talking to, yeah. <laughs> talking to my friends in the White House who were like, see, we are doing something. I was like, actually, <laughs> um, not really. Um, there's four, they sanctioned four settlers. 
We sanctioned four settlers who were involved in the attack on Hawara. That's it. So what, you know, but the U.S. is doing that obviously because they're worried about November 2024. And they want to show that they're doing something. So they're doing the least in this moment. Um, so what do we do in terms of sanctions? There's a lot. There's a lot of U.S. law that we can actually apply. We don't even need international law. There's the Arms Export Control Act. There's the Leahy Amendment. There's, you know, things that, you know, the Office of uh, Department of Treasury can do in order to sanction different um, businesses. We can revoke the status of certain organizations that are actually foreign agents and revoke their C4 status, right? There's a lot of U.S. law that we can use. The problem is that the political will is opposed to it. I don't think that we're just sending weapons. I actually believe that this is a U.S. war. This is a U.S. war. And so it's, I think it's really difficult now for us to find the means, which is why it's actually really wonderful that the other thing that the ICJ decision did is it's isolating the U.S. more and more politically. Um, and today when, um, or yesterday, I think it was, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, the prime ministers called for a ceasefire. They're joining a long list. And Europe is distancing itself from the United States. So we're, that's the work that I think um, we need to continue to do. Can I just ask folks to be very brief in their questions? Because we only have about we only have about five minutes left. Oh, and we need because we have a reception waiting for us. I'm office. happy to take you yeah. know two questions at a time. Or yeah, three. can we take one on maybe on I could be side? briefer? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not really good at being brief. <laughs> Let's take one here and then one there. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Arkad, for being here. A privilege to be in your presence and learn from you. you. Can you please expand on um, Palestinian right to self-defense and resistance? We spoke and debunked the Israeli right to self-defense. Yeah. But can we speak a little bit more about Palestinian voices and center that as well, um, whether from international perspective, international law perspective, or your own perspective? Appreciate it. I'm going to give you the international law perspective. This is going to be really fast. Okay. And I don't think this is going to be very popular, and I've seen this come up a lot, you know, as people. Um, I do think I, in, you know, according to international law, Palestinians, not just Palestinians, all peoples, all peoples, and this is Article 1-4 of the First Additional Protocol of 1977, have the right to use force against racist regimes and alien occupations, all right? This is not in contest, but that right comes with responsibility. And whether it's in international law or this is my moral compass right here, civilians are off limits, period. And I know that that's, you know, that's come into question, but who is a civilian, settler civilians, who is, it, you know, and I think if you are not bearing arms, you are a civilian. If you are not part of a combat unit or, you know, attacking, you are a civilian. If you pick up arms and you are attacking, that now we get into different questions. Your status might change. But that Palestinians under, under these international laws, even though they have the right to use force to defend themselves, to fight off racist regimes and occupations, have to do so within the bounds of distinction, proportionality, um, the laws of, of, that also apply to all forces. So there's no exception. Now, you might say, well, the law is BS and we don't want that. And that's, that's fine too, but this is where I stand. All right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Sirsha Don Palestine from Ireland. Uh, it's always always good to see the old alliances still stand. Uh, but next, uh, one aspect of legal uh, jargon that gets brought up is universal jurisdiction. Yes. Uh, can you speak to that? I'd love to. Shall I take one more question? Sure, too? sure. Lena, do you want to ask her a question as well? In your um, conception of international law as a tool to influence imagination rather than something that's a strictly enforceable rule. And so I was wondering to what extent you see Israel's legal argumentation of the West Bank and Gaza being disputed territory rather than occupied territory as influencing um, public imagination. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Good questions. So universal jurisdiction, um, 
Universal jurisdiction refers to a form of jurisdiction that basically gives any state the right to prosecute a crime that was basically so heinous that it offended all of humanity, even if there isn't a territorial link or a passive or an active link, right? So even if your citizen wasn't the victim, the aggressor, it didn't happen on your territory, there's something called universal jurisdiction to be able to prosecute these cases. And it hasn't been used very much, but it normally is used in the aftermath of war when there's when there's a lot of support, right? So France used it a lot against Rwandans. We've seen it. We used it here in the United States, here in Washington, D.C., um, under a U.S. form of it known as the Alien Tort Statute to sue um, Moshe Alon for his responsibility in bombing a Unifil compound in the south of Lebanon in, um, to, in 1996. Um, as well as Avi Dichter in the New York District Court. And we basically now this idea of universal jurisdiction is giving the right of states, right, to try if Israeli accused war criminals travel to their countries to try them in their jurisdiction. And I assure you that there are attorneys, teams of attorneys all over the world that are preparing cases. And so I hope, again, not for revenge, but for accountability, that we actually see these cases come to fruition. You'll be disappointed in cases where we have been successful. For example, Hickman and Rose sued Doran on Mag in 2006, in, um, it, and he didn't get off the tarmac in London and Heathrow, right? Well, the UK has since changed the law to make that a lot more difficult and so on and so forth. Um, but there are countries that are eager to do this. I think Malaysia's eager. Turkey might be eager, Chile might be eager, um, Bolivia might be eager. You know, certain there's a lot of there's a lot of jurisdictions and there's cases that we're we're going to see in especially against the dual nationals, which isn't universal jurisdiction, but another kind of case. So another reminder that what the what these international tribunals do doesn't just concentrate this authority, that it could be diffuse. Yeah, I'm excited. And then there was a question about imagination. I and then I think we're going to have to wrap. Oh, okay. Well, I just if, 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 okay. Um, international imagination. Look, as much as I deplore what Israel has done to the law, I applaud them as le uh, as legal thinkers and legal advocates. They're brilliant. Missing reversioner. Wow, that one. I don't know where you pulled that one out of, but it worked, and it has worked since '67. Right. And so even the U.S. State Department would, has has changed now under the Trump administration. At least it doesn't even call the territories occupied anymore. And in some cases, it doesn't even matter. Israel declared sovereignty over the Golan Heights, where Syria's sovereignty is not contested or disputed or in question ever. And there still hasn't been um, any accountability. So in part, yes, it's the it's this legal imagination, how influential it is. Right. When they call it Judea and Samaria. That's part of this work. When they say that the Arabs invaded, that's part of this work. When they tell you that they can go to any of the 22 other Arab countries in order to negate a, um, a juridical status as a people, that's part of that work, right? But it's all legal work. It's all legal work. And so I don't like it, um, but I think that they're doing what any good attorneys would do on behalf of their client. So are you saying to me you want to take the rest of these questions quickly? Can we do a quick round of the questions and I'll see what I can answer so y'all can get out? Thank you so much, Professor Arakat, for your wonderful lecture and also for your advocacy. Um, my question, I, I do want to say I completely support all forms of Palestinian resistance and stand in solidarity with all Palestinians resisting the occupation. But my question is about um, the Great March of Return when Israel, I feel, had even less of a claim to their still Ill illegitimate claim of self-defense when they were yeah. killing um, unarmed civilian nonviolent protesters. And I just my question is, where did the law fail in protecting those civilians? Excellent. Okay. Thank yeah. you. We can, ask, we can ask your question, too. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Thank you so much again for being here. Um, I just wanted to ask like a more specific question. Um, 
like regarding evidence. So with the property developers holding public advertising campaigns and conferences in Israel right now for new settlements in North Gaza be counted or qualify as evidence in future potential court cases against them? Excellent question. And that's exactly so right now what Israel is making the argument and you see that they're also covering themselves, right? They're making the argument that this is fringe. This is the far right. They're not going to be in government. They don't count. And they're not actually speaking for all Israelis because they're the far right. So that's why that might not be counted as evidence. And it is compelling, at least to the Ugandan judge, to the Israeli ad hoc judge. And if you read Judge Nolte's decision as well, the German judge, the German judge voted for all the provisional measures, but doesn't think it's genocide. Right. So I, I'm, I'm not there. The argument is going to be that they're fringe and that they're not representative, right? What about the Great March of Return? So the look, at the basis of this, everything that you can explain, I tell this to my students all the time when we're studying this, they're like, but there's, where's the link? Where's the logical link? And a lot of things that we can explain is explained by the most obvious thing. Racism, period. Like you wanna understand why is it we can't recognize Palestinians as fighting a liberation struggle, it's really hard to see them as human. Most people that want to save Palestinians want to save them from their barbaric men who are oppressing them, right? Or from our backwards way of life, if we have a human life to begin with, right? You can't cry over children because, as Golda Meir said, they made us do this to them, right? There is, and, and I know that's really hard for us to gather, but I just don't understand. You know, I have no other way to explain it when somebody says, all you need is a Palestinian Gandhi. And I think of the, th I'm glad you think it's funny. I, I'm so annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of Gandhi that we've given the world that have been ignored or assassinated or imprisoned or exiled, and amongst them, 35 to 40,000 Palestinians in the Great March of Return, who, before the march even started, okay, Avigdor Lieberman said we are going to, when he was the Minister of Defense at the time, said we are going to meet them with disproportionate force. He literally said on the mic in front of people, we will use excessive force. Before he even saw what the threat was, he admitted to it beforehand when they asked but this is a march why wouldn't you you why are you using snipers from a 300 meter distance behind a militarized perimeter they said because the water hoses are too we couldn't get close enough with the water hoses right if you look at the supreme court jurisprudence and this is part of my the research that i do the supreme court jurisprudence reads the Palestinian Great March of Return as a new weapon of Hamas. I wish I was lying. And recognizes that there were civilians in these marches, but they were the exception. But otherwise, it was a weapon against Hamas because it was Israeli human rights organization that sued the government and said, why are you sniping at these marches? They were shooting them above the head. 95% of the casualties were shot in the head and neck and in the back. Said, why aren't you, they're marching to a militarized perimeter. They're not threatening a single Israeli, a single soldier, a single even military officer. And the court responded and said that this is where you blur hostilities and, and, and peacetime. They're not recognizing Palestinian civilians. They don't exist. They don't exist. And so that was that was the jurisprudence um, that was established um, in 2018. And to the rest of the world, it was framed as a Hamas march. Right? And even if it was, by the way, organized by Hamas, that doesn't make the marchers themselves not civilians. Right? Even they as a nascent sovereign do have, they're, they're, there's no elections. But, you know, they won the last one. Um, and they do have the right, you know, even if it was theirs. But it was that Hamas overdetermines everything else and becomes a racializing discourse just as a word, which is why I'm sure if you have debates on campus, your opposition has a much easier time 
because they just have to say a word and you're pulling up maps and doing the history and you got decades and you took the class and watched the documentaries and have your receipts and they can stand there and say, but Hamas, and that's it. And that's so frustrating. Um, but I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. And I, you know, my elders will actually say more than me, but as somebody who's been in this for a minute, it's far different now than it was before. And I don't think there's a go and ever, ever, ever turning back after this. Yeah.